Three Little Pigs, written by Roald Dahl. The animal I really do. Above all others is the pig. Pigs are noble, pigs are clever. Pigs are courteous, however. Now and then, to break this rule, one meets a pig who is a fool. What, for example, would you say? If strolling through the woods one day, right there in front of you, you saw a pig who built his house of straw, the wolf who saw this licked his lips and said, that pig has had his chips. Little pig, little pig, let me come in. No, no, by the hair of my chinny chin chin. Then I'll huff and I'll puff and I'll blow your house in. The pig began to pray, but Wolfie blew the house away. He shouted, bacon, pork and ham. Oh, what a lucky wolf I am. Although he ate the pig quite fast, he carefully saved the tail till last. Wolf wandered on, a trifle bloated. Surprise, surprise, he soon noted another little house for pigs. But this one was built out of twigs. Little pig, little pig, let me come in. No, no, by the hair of my chinny chin chin. Then I'll huff and I'll puff and I'll blow your house in. Wolf said, okay, here we go. He then began to blow and blow. The pig began to squeal. He cried, oh wolf, you've already had one meal. Why can't we talk and make a deal? The wolf replied, not on your nelly. Soon the pig was in his belly. <laughs> Two juicy little pigs, wolf cried, but I'm still not satisfied. I know full well my tummy's bulging. Oh, how I adore indulging. Creepingly as quiet as mouse, wolf approached another house, which also had inside another little piggy trying to hide. But this one, piggy number three, was as bright and as brainy as could be. No straw for him, no sticks or twigs. He built his house of bricks. You'll not get me, pig cried. I'll blow you down, the wolf replied. You'll need, pig said, a lot of puff, and I think you don't have enough. Wolf huffed and puffed and blew and blew, but the house stayed up as good as new. If I can't blow it down, Wolf said, I'll have to blow it up instead. I'll come back in the dead of night and I'll blow it up with dynamite. Pig cried, you brute, I might have known. So picking up the telephone and dialed as quickly as he could, the number of Red Riding Hood. The Soldier by Rupert Brooke. If I should die, think only this of me, that there's some corner of a foreign field that is forever England. There shall be in that rich earth a richer dust concealed, a dust whom England, born, shaped, made aware, gave once her flowers to love, her ways to roam. A body of England, breathing English air, washed by the rivers, blessed by the sons of home. And think, this heart, all evil shed away, a pulse in the eternal mind, no less gives somewhere back her thoughts by England given, her sights and sounds, dreams happy as her day. And laughter, learn to friends, and gentleness in hearts at peace, under an English heaven. If by Rudyard Kipling. If you can keep your head when all about you are losing theirs and blaming it on you. If you can trust yourself when all men doubt you but make allowance for their doubting too. If you can wait and not be tired by waiting or being lied about don't deal in lies or being hated. Don't give way to hating. And yet, don't look too good nor talk too wise. If you can dream and not make dreams your master. If you can think and not make thoughts your aim. If you can meet with triumph and disaster and treat those two imposters just the same. If you can bear to the truth you've spoken, twisted by knaves to make a trap for fools, 
or watch the things you gave your life to, broken and stoop and build them up with worn out tools. If you can make one heap of all your winnings and risk it on one turn of pitch and toss and lose and start again at your beginnings and never breathe a word about your loss. If you can force your heart and nerve and sinew to serve your turn long after they're gone and so hold on when there is nothing in you except the will which says to them, hold on. If you can talk with crowds and keep your virtue or walk with kings, nor lose the common touch. If neither foes nor loving friends can hurt you. If all men count with you, but none too much. If you can fill the unforgiving minute with 60 seconds worth of distance run. Yours is the earth and everything that's in it. And, which is more, you'll be a man, my son. by Michael Rosen. We had a teacher who was so strict. You weren't allowed to breathe in her lessons. She used to stand out the front going, no breathing, and you had the whole morning to get through. The weak ones used to keel over and die. You could hear them going down behind you, kaboom, Kaboom, kaboom. And there was always a whiny kid going, Miss, can I go out and do some breathing? And she'd say, No, you've got all playtime to do it. And, Oh, come on, Miss, oh, come on. Did you know at the beginning of the week there were 48 kids in my class? And at the end of the week, there are only five of them left. Yeah, do you know you'd have to be stepping over kids just to get out of the room? Oh no, there's Melanie. That's a shame, she was really nice. There's Dave. Hard luck, Dave. Always knew you were a bit weak. You know, people say to me, if that's true, how come you're here to tell the tale? Fair enough, and I'll tell you. It's because when I was at school, we used to sit at desks. Not like you do now, sitting around a table. We used to sit at desks with Liz. And some of us figured out what you had to do was snatch a quick breath under the desk lid while she wasn't looking. So once from the beginning, no breathing, the weak ones, kaboom, kaboom. Kaboom, the whiny ones. Miss, can I go out and do some breathing? No, you've got all playtime to do it. Oh, go on, miss. Oh, go on. But that was the mistake, slamming the desk lid down. If you made a noise with the desk lid, it was out, school, prison. There was a prison underneath the school hall where they used to string you up from wall bars. Miss, I've been up here for three weeks and there's rats and they're nibbling my toenails. So I figured out what you had to do was put your thumb round the edge of the desk lid so when it went down, it didn't make any noise at all. So once from the beginning, no breathing, the weak ones, kaboom, 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 the whiny ones. Miss, can I go out and do some breathing? No, you've got all playtime to do it. Oh, come on, miss, oh, come on. No noise at all. Survival! <laughs> Little Red Riding Hood and the Wolf by Raoul Dahl. As soon as Wolf began to feel that he would like a decent meal, he went and knocked on Grandma's door. When Grandma opened it, she saw the sharp white teeth 
the horrid grin, and Wolfie said, May I come in? Poor Grandmama was terrified. He's going to eat me up, she cried. And she was absolutely right. He ate her up in one big bite. But Grandmama was small and tough, and Wolfie wailed. That's not enough. I haven't yet begun to feel that I have had a decent meal. He ran around the kitchen, yelping. I've got to have a second helping. Then added with a frightful leer, I'm therefore going to wait right here till little Miss Red Riding Hood comes home from walking in the wood. He quickly put on Grandma's clothes. Of course he hadn't eaten those. He dressed himself in coat and hat. He put on shoes and after that, he even brushed and curled his hair. Then sat himself in Grandma's chair. In came the little girl in red. She stopped. She stared. And then she said, What great big ears you have, Grandma. All the better to hear you with. The wolf replied, What great big eyes you have, Grandma, said Little Red Riding Hood. All the better to see you with, the wolf replied. He sat there watching her and smiled. He thought, I'm going to eat this child. Compared with her old Grandma, she's going to taste like caviar. <laughs> then Little Red Riding Hood said, But, Grandma, what a lovely great big furry coat you have on. That's wrong, cried Wolf. Have you forgot to tell me what big teeth I've got? Oh, well, no matter what you say, I'm going to eat you anyway. <coughs> the small girl smiles, one eyelid flickers. She whips a pistol from her knickers. <laughs> she aims it at the creature's head and bang, bang, bang. And she shoots him dead. A few weeks later, in the wood, I came across Miss Riding Hood. But what a change, no cloak of red, no silly hood upon her head. She said, hello, and do please note my lovely furry wolfskin coat. Sonnet 29 by William Shakespeare. When in disgrace with fortune and men's eyes, I all alone beweep my outcast state and trouble death heaven with my bootless cries and look upon myself and curse my fate, wishing me like to one more rich in hope, featured like him like him with friends, possessed, desiring this man's art or that man's scope. With what I most enjoy, contented least. Yet in these thoughts, myself almost despising, happily I think on thee. And then my state, like to the lark at break of day, arising from sullen earth, sings hymns at heaven's gate. For thy sweet love remembered, such wealth brings, that then I scorn to change my state with kings. Archibald by John Betjeman. The bear who sits above my bed, a doleful bear he is to see. From out his drooping pear-shaped head, his woolen eyes look into me. He has no mouth. But seems to say, they'll burn you on the judgment day. Those woolen eyes, the things they've seen. Those flannel ears, the things they've heard. Among horse chestnut fans of green, the fluting on an April bird. And quarrelling downstairs until door slammed at 31 West Hill. The dreaded evening keyhole scratch, announcing some return below. Nursery landings lifted latch. The punishment to undergo. Still I could smooth those half-moon ears and wet that forehead with my tears. Whatever rush to catch the train, whatever joy there was to share, 
or sounding seaboard, rainbowed rain, or seaweed sent to Cornish air. Sharing the laughs, you still were there, you ugly, unrepentant bear. When nine, I hid you in a loft, and dared not let you share my bed. My father would have thought me soft, or so, at least, my mother said. She only then our secret knew, and thus my guilty passion grew. The bear who sits above my bed, more aged now he is to see. His woollen eyes have thinner thread, but still he seems to say to me, in double doom notes, like a knell, you're half a century nearer hell. Self-pity shrouds me in a mist and drowns me in my self-esteem. The freckled faces I have kissed float by me in a guilty dream. The only constant sitting there, patient and hairless, is a bear. And if an analyst one day of school, of Adler, Jung or Freud should take this aged bear away, then, oh my God, the dreadful void, its drafty darkness could but be eternity. Eternity. Charge of the Light Brigade by Alfred Lord Tennyson. Half the league! Half the league! Half the league onwards! All in the Valley of Death wrote the 600. Ford the Light Brigade! Charge for the guns, he said! In the Valley of Death wrote the 600. Ford the Light Brigade! Was there a man dismayed? Not the soldier knew. Someone had blundered. There's not to make reply. There's not to reason why. There's but to do and die. In to the valley of death, wrote the 600. Cannons to the right of them. Cannons to the left of them. Cannon in front of them. Volleyed and thundered. Stormed out with shot and shell. Boldly they rode and well. Into the jaws of death. In to the mouth of hell wrote the 600. Flashed all their sabres bare, flashed as they turned in air, sabring the gunners there, charging an army while all the world wondered. Plunged through the battery smoke, right through the line they broke. Cossack and Russians reeled from the sabre stroke, shattered and sundered. Then they rode back, but not, not the 600. Cannon to right of them, cannon to left of them, Cannon behind them, volleyed and thundered, stormed out with shot and shell, while horse and hero fell. They that had fought so well came from the jaws of death, back from the mouth of hell. All that was left of them left the 600. When can their glory fade? Oh, the wild charge they made. All the world wandered. Honour the charge they made. Honour the light brigade. Noble 600. to read you a letter from a young boy who, uh, who was writing to a director at the time and he really wanted to get a job. Dear Mr Hill, seeing that I've seen your fantastically entertaining and award-winning film, The Sting, starring Paul Newman and Robert Redford, and enjoyed it very much, it is altogether fitting and proper that you should discover me. Now, right away, I know what you're thinking. Who is this kid? And I can understand your apprehensions. I am a nobody. But I figure if I change my name to Humphrey Boggart, people will recognize me. My looks are not stunning. I'm not built like a Greek god and I can't even grow a moustache. But, I figure, if people will pay to see certain films, they will pay to see me. Let's work out the details of my discovery. We could do it the way Lana Turner was discovered, me sitting on a soda shop stool. You walk in and notice me, and bango, I'm a star. Or, maybe, we could do it this way. I stumble into your office one day and beg for a job. To get rid of me, you give me a standing part in your next film. 
While shooting the film, the star breaks his leg in the dressing room, and because you are already behind schedule, you arbitrarily place me in his part, and bango, I'm a star. All of these plans are fine with me, or we could do it any way you would like. It makes no difference to me. But let's get one thing straight, Mr Hill. I do not want to be some big-time Hollywood superstar with girls crawling all over me. Just a hometown American boy who's hit the big time, owns a Porsche, and calls Robert Redford Bob. <laughs> Your pal forever, Thomas J. Hanks. My monologue is Julius Caesar by Shakespeare, and I'm playing Antony. Friends, Romans, countrymen, lend me your ears. I come to bury Caesar, not to praise him. The evil that men do lives after them. The good is often turned with their bones. So let it be with Caesar. The noble Brutus hath told you Caesar was ambitious. If it were so, this was a grievous fault, and grievously hath Caesar answered it. Here, I'm the leaver of Brutus and the rest, for Brutus is an honourable man, and so are they all, all honourable men. Come I to speak in Caesar's funeral. He was my friend, faithful and just to me. But Brutus says he was ambitious, and Brutus is an honourable man. He hath brought many captives home to Rome, whose ransoms did the general coffers fill. Did this in Caesar seem ambitious? When that the poor hath cried, Caesar hath wept. Ambition should be made of stern stuff. Yet Brutus says he was ambitious, and sure, he is an honourable man. You all did see that on the loop, girl. I did thrice present him a kingly crown, which he did thrice refuse. Was this ambition? Yet Brutus says he was ambitious, and sure, he is an honourable man. I speak not to disprove what Brutus spoke, but here I am to speak what I do know. You all did love him once, not without cause. What cause has hold you then to mourn for him? O oh, judgment thou art fled, to brutish beasts, and men have lost their reason. Bear with me. My heart is in the coffin there with Caesar, and I must pause till it comes back to me. Welcome to Hell by Rowan Atkinson. Hello, it's nice to see you all here again. Now, as the more perceptive of you may have realised by now, this is Hell, and I am the devil. Good evening. But you can call me Toby, if you like. We try to keep things informal down here, as well as infernal. That's just a little joke. I tell it every time. Now, you're all here for eternity, which I hardly tell you is a heck of a long time. So you get to know each other pretty well by the end. But for now, I'm going to have to split you up into groups. Will you stop screaming? Thank you. Murderers, over here, please. Thank you. Looters and pillagers, over here. Thieves, if you could join, and lawyers, you're in that lot too. Fornicators, if you could step forward. My God, there are a lot of you. Could I split you up into adulterers and the rest? Male adulterers, if you could form a line in front of that small guillotine in the corner over there. Thank you. Um, atheists. Atheists? 
fists? I'm sure you're feeling a right bunch of nitwits. <coughs> Christians, Christians? Ah, oh, yes, I'm afraid the Jews were right. <coughs> and finally, the French. Are you here? If you could come down here with the Germans, I'm sure you'll have plenty to talk about. <laughs> um, are there any questions? No, I'm afraid we don't have any toilets. If you read your Bible, you'd know it's damnation without relief. So if you didn't go before you came, I'm afraid you're not going to enjoy yourself. But I believe that's the idea. Well, that's all from me, and it's over to you, Adolf. I'll catch you all at the barbecue. Thank you. Dolce et decor mest by Wilfred Owen. Bend double like old beggars under sacks. Knock kneed, coughing like hags, we curse through sludge. Till on the haunting flares we turned our backs and towards our distant west began to trudge. Men marked the sleep. Many had lost their boots, but limped on, bloodshod. All went lame, all blind. Drunk with fatigue, death even with the hoots of the tired outstripped by nine to drop behind. Gas, gas, quick boys, an ecstasy of fumbling, fitting the clumsy helmets just in time. But someone still was yelling out and stumbling and floundering like a man in fire or lime. Dim through the misty panes and thick green light, as under a green sea I saw him drowning. In all my dreams, before my helpless sight, he plunges at me, guttering, choking, drowning. If in some smothering dream you too could pace behind the wagon, we flung him in and watched the right eyes writhing in his face. His hanging face, like a devil sick of sin. If you could hear at every jolt, the blood come gargling for his froth corrupted lungs. Obscene as cancer, bitter as the cud, or vile incurable sores and innocent tongues. My friend, you would not tell with such high zest to children ardent for some desperate glory. The old lie. Dolce et decorum est, pro patria mori. England is at war with Germany by Neville Chamberlain. I am speaking to you from the cabinet room at 10 Downing Street. This morning, the British ambassador in Berlin handed the German government a final note, stating that unless we heard from them by 11 o'clock, that they were prepared at once to withdraw their troops from Poland. A state of war would exist between us. I have to tell you now that no such undertaking has been received and that consequently this country is at war with Germany. You can imagine what a bitter blow it is to me that all my long struggle to win peace has failed. Yet, I cannot believe there was anything more or anything different that I could have done and that would have been more successful. Up to the very last, it would have been quite possible to have arranged a peaceful and honourable settlement between Germany and Poland. But Hitler would not have it. He had evidently made up his mind to attack Poland, whatever happened. And although he now says he put forward reasonable proposals which were rejected by the Poles, that is not a true statement. 
The proposals were never shown to the Poles, nor to us. And though they were announced in a German broadcast on Thursday night, Hitler did not wait to hear comments on them, but ordered his troops to cross the Polish frontier. His action shows convincingly that there is no chance of expecting that this man will ever give up his practice of using force to gain his win. He can only be stopped by force. We in France are today in fulfilment of our obligations going to the aid of Poland, who is so bravely resisting this wicked and unprovoked attack upon her people. We have a clear conscience. We have done all that any country could do to establish peace. But a situation in which no word given by Germany's ruler could be trusted, and no people or country could feel themselves safe, had become intolerable. And now that we have resolved to finish it, I know that you will all play your part with calmness and courage. Now may God bless you all, and may he defend the right, for it is evil things that we shall be fighting against. Brute force, bad faith, injustice, oppression and persecution. And against them, I am certain that right will prevail. Bat Cave by Eleanor Wilner. The cave looked much like any other from little distance, but as we approached, came almost to its mouth, we saw its walls within that slanted up into a dome, while beating like a wild black lung. It was plastered and hung with the pulsing bodies of bats, the organ music of the body's deep interior, alive in the sacred cave, with its 10,000 gleaming eyes near the clustered rocks where the sea beat with the leather wings of its own dark waves. Below the bat hung throbbing walls, an altar stood, glittering with guano, like a gaudy church. Berserk. Baroque stone translated into flux, murk, and mud. And the floral extravagance of wet sand dripped from a giant hand, giving back blessing, excrement, return for the first fruits offered to the gods. The Listeners, by Walter de Lemaire. Is there anybody there? Said the, tra said the traveller, knocking on the moonlit door. And his horse, in the silence, champed the grasses of the forest's ferny floor. And a bird flew up, out of the turret, above the traveller's head. And he smote upon the door again a second time. Is there anybody there? He said. But no one descended to the traveller. No head from the leaf-fringed sill leaned over and looked into his grey eyes, where he stood, perplexed and still. But only a host of phantom listeners that dwelt in the lone house then, stood listening in the quiet of the moonlight to that voice from the world of men, stood thronging the faint moonbeams on the dark stair that goes down into the empty hall, hearkening in an air, stirred and shaken by the lonely traveller's call. And he felt in his heart their strangeness, their stillness answering his cry, while his horse moved, cropping the dark turf neath the starred and leafy sky. For suddenly he smote on the door even louder and lifted his head. 
Tell them I came, and no one answered, that I kept my word, he said. Never the least stir made the listeners, though every word he spake fell echoing through the shadowiness of the still house from the one man left awake. Aye, they heard his foot upon the stirrup and the sound of iron on stone, and how the silence surged softly backward when the plunging hoofs were gone. In Flanders Fields by John McRae. In Flanders Fields, the poppies blow between the crosses, row on row, that mark our place. And in the sky, the larks, still bravely singing, fly. Scarce heard amid the guns below. We are the dead, sure days ago. We lived, felt dawn, saw sunset glow, loved and were loved, and now we lie in Flanders field. Take up our quarrel with the foe, to you with failing hands we throw. The torch, be yours, so hold it high. If ye break faith with us who die, we shall not sleep, though poppies blow in Flanders fields. Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are dead by Tom Stoppard. It's silly to be depressed by it. One thinks of it like being alive in a box. One keeps forgetting to take into account the fact that one is dead, which should make a difference, shouldn't it? I mean, you never know you're in a box, would you? It would be just like being asleep in a box. Not that I'd like to sleep in a box, mind you. Not without any air in it. You'd wake up dead for a start, and then where would you be? Apart from inside a box. That's the bit I don't like. Frankly. That's why I don't think of it. Because you'd be helpless, wouldn't you, stuffed in a box like that? I mean, you'd be in there forever. Even taking into account the fact that you're dead. Really? <sighs> Ask yourself. If I asked you straight off, I'm going to stuff you in this box now, would you prefer to be alive or dead? Naturally, you prefer to be alive. Life in a box is better than no life at all. I expect. You'd have a chance, at least. You could lie there thinking, well, at least I'm not dead. In a minute, someone's going to bang the lid and tell me to come out. <sighs> I wouldn't think about it, if I were you. You'd only get depressed. Eternity is a terrible thought. I mean, where's it going to end? War Photographer by Carol Ann Duffy. In his dark room, he is finally alone with spools of suffering set out in ordered rows. The only light is red and softly glows, as this were a church, and he a priest preparing to intone a mass. Belfast, Beirut, Phnom Penh, all flesh is grass. He has a job to do. Solutions slop in trays beneath his hands, which did not tremble then though seem to now. Rural England, home again to ordinary pain which simple weather can dispel, to fields which don't explode beneath the feet of running children in a nightmare heat. Something's happening. A stranger's features faintly start to twist before his eyes. A half-armed ghost! He remembers the cries of this man's wife, how he sought approval without words to do what someone must, and how the blood stained into foreign dust. A hundred agonies in black and white, from which his editor will pick out five or six for Sunday's supplement. 
the reader's eyeballs prick with tears between the bath and pre-lunch beers. And from the aeroplane, he stares impassively at where he earns his living. And they do not care. The Destruction of Sennacherib by Lord Byron. The Assyrian came down like the wolf on the fold, and his cohorts were gleaming in purple and gold. The sheen of their spears was like stars on the sea, as the blue wave rolls nightly on deep Galilee. Like the leaves of the forest, when summer is green, that host with their banners at sunset were seen. Like the leaves of the forest, when autumn hath blown, that host on the moors, they withered and strown. For the angel of death had spread his wings on the blast, and he breathed in the face of the foe as he passed. For the eyes of the sleepers waxed deadly and chill, and their hearts but once heaved, forever grew still. And there lay the steed with his nostril all wide, and through it rolled not the breath of his pride, and the foam of his gasping lay white on the turf, and cold as the spray of the rock-beating surf. And there lay the rider, distorted and pale, with dew on his brow and rust on his mail, and the tents were all silent, the banners alone, the lances unlifted, the trumpets unblown, and the widows of Asher were loud in their wail, while idols were broke in the temple of Baal. And the might of the Gentile, unsmote by the sword, hath melted like snow in a glance of the Lord. Sonnet 18 by William Shakespeare. Shall I compare thee to a summer's day? Thou art more lovely and more temperate. Rough winds do shake the darling buds of May. And summer's lease hath all too short a date. Sometime too hot the eye of heaven shines. And often is his gold complexion dimmed. And every fair from fair some time declines. By chance, or nature's changing course untrimmed. But thy eternal summer shall not fade. Nor lose possession of that fair thou owest. Nor shall death brag, thou wanderest in a shade. So long as men can breathe and eyes can see, so long lives this, and this gives life to thee.